Okay, uh, Sarah. Hello, there she is. <laughs> we are really happy to have Sarah Roseman with us today. Uh, I think we're in Italy right now, are we? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but normally you are based in the Netherlands, a uh, Canadian designer. Um, recently graduated from the Design Academy Eindhoven. And, um, but that was, I think, about two years ago. And, but still, uh, that's rather recent. Um, Sarah is really passionate about creating a more beautiful world through materiality and works on the boundary of textile and object. She experiments with techniques and reclaimed materials, transforming and pushing boundaries uh, to bring about the unexpected. There is a familiar, familiarity uh, within her work to materials of the everyday, which she draws into her process so that we feel at home, maybe at home, in a new space that is home-ish. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really wonderful, wonderfully uh, happy, pleased that you're here and that we can go into the world of, of Sarah. And, and find new homes. So uh, welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, and I'm super honored to be part of this. It's been amazing, all the inspiring speakers so far. Um, so yeah, I mean, thanks for the great introduction. I don't know how much more I need to add. Um, I'm based in Eindhoven uh, and I focus my studio mostly around textile techniques, um, like you said earlier, but really with focus on the non-textile world and kind of pushing the boundaries of the medium. Uh, so I use textile, of course, as a means for self-expression, but also in different areas, like to innovate, to create something more sustainable, to marry with reclaimed materials, as we'll see with my different projects. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Yeah, it's uh, working. Yep. All right. Um, so, yes. Uh, the first project I'll be talking about today is called Fluid Furniture. It's a collaboration with Barry Llewellyn. And it was a project that I did about two years ago. It started at the beginning of the COVID lockdown. It actually started the first week of the COVID lockdown. So it was a very spontaneous project. It's really like a project of the pandemic times, for sure. Um, and it really began when we were still studying, uh, everything kind of closed, and um, it was really about self-sufficiency. So we took, uh, yeah, we took this uh, couch that we found on the street, and we wanted to make furniture, um, but then everything was closed. So of course we had to start creating our own processes. And if, just if I go back to the last slide, uh, it's really about how our relationship to creating will change once we no longer have access to virgin material. So the goal was really to take what was already there, this found street furniture, uh, just from, yeah, for free, things that we just found lying around and uh, deconstruct them completely, really looking at the haphazard ways they're constructed in this industrial process, taking apart every single staple, every single line of thread to as cleanly as possible, deconstruct something that is never meant to be recycled. So this kind of started the challenge of creating this new piece of furniture and this new life of the couch, if you will. Uh, so here you can see we divided it into categories and with each category, we started to create our own tools to create these new crafts um, to transform the material. So we have textiles and foam, the stuffing, of course, uh, lots of metal and wood. Uh, this is really, I think, part of the rise of inventiveness and self-sufficiency. I think it's something that people are a lot more interested in now, and there's a lot of talk about um, something going forward in the future. So I think this was kind of our expression of it um, in the time that we didn't have access to any of these facilities. Uh, so here you can see like the textile of the couch. Uh, I think something really interesting about the project is that it uses these kind of devalued qualities of the material, such as 
synthetic textile, it's something that can melt really easily. Uh, but then we kind of saw this as an advantage. So we created this rope spinning like DIY machine. Uh, this is just in an apartment here, uh, totally homemade. Um, then we used a heat gun to twist the rope into this new yarn. So it's really like a new yarn making out of this textile that could have never been recycled. Uh, then we have our weaving studio here. So reupholstering this new piece of furniture. All of the wood was actually from the original chair. Uh, and you can see kind of the beauty of the material finding a new life. Uh, this is from the stuffing here. Um, kind of again using this kind of plastic quality to create a hard material again so giving it another chance. Uh, something that was really beautiful about the project and something I still really look for in my work is material inconsistencies. Um, so of course like working with the mattress foam you have a lot of different colors following the UV degradation and this is something that we kind of saw as a beautiful thing because when you take it out of context it can be this beautiful, interesting, unusual material. Um, so using this kind of rainbow of colors, we created uh, ropes out of the mattress bumps. So all the ropes you see here are all taken from the couch in the first slide and some other mattresses as well. Uh, and kind of creating this new color palette based on, yeah, based on the different kind of ages of the foam, everything was kind of from a different context. Um, so then it's kind of this twisting technique uh, also without adding any other materials that was very important to kind of re, um, retain the original quality and then this is twisted around the form of the lamp uh, the springs of course were transformed into a loom uh, for these rope these foam ropes this was like made into the lampshade but it is just kind of an example of different possibilities of these new craft practices and finally, this is kind of our, our work area at the time, a couple of years ago. Um, I think it was really interesting just to kind of have everything happen at home and work with things taken from domestic space and transform them in domestic space and kind of, yeah, have this whole like process going on in this very small environment. Uh, I think it definitely led to some more inventiveness than if we'd been able to go out and have all the machines that we are used to. Um, yeah, and this is the final lamp, so kind of a overview of the different techniques. And this is the series, which is a continuing series that we're still working on now. So for the next project, uh, Molten Memories, also done uh, for my graduation a couple of years ago in 2021. Um, and the original concept of this was really built on the ideas of the furniture so it's really like looking at these materials and trying to find the new value in them um, but i think for this it was more connected to the emotional value of the materials so of course it started with material scavenging uh looking around the city still i guess kind of during the COVID period really kind of inspired this way of working um yeah so it really it was like a library of all these different materials from demolition sites uh, from people's renovations, uh, taking everything that I could. Uh, so you can kind of see there's like floorboards and vinyl, linoleum. Yeah, of course, reclaimed yarn that makes the whole carpet a whole. Um, and it's really about uh, how we can connect back to these materials that we grow up around, uh, things that we kind of discard, but actually when you take it out of context, again, something that can really bring us together. So I think when I showed the piece, it was really a gathering place for people to look back on their memories and look back in these materials and kind of connect to one another and connect back to the past. So this is just another example of the, uh, yeah, the material kind of collecting and scavenging around the city. Uh, yeah, again, it's the idea of adding craft to this low value material, something that was really in the garbage, but then has kind of had a shared value through the craft processes. This is old uh, carpeting. It's old stair carpeting that was found at a school. And uh, here I kind of unwind it, taking it back from the carpet back into a new yarn, and then kind of going backwards and making it back into a carpet, but in a new way. 
Uh, it's also just about respecting these pieces as artifacts, um, as pieces of material that kind of exist as they are, and then caressing them with the textile and with the techniques that go around them. So here we have linoleum also taken from an old school. I think it's a very nostalgic material for a lot of people. Um, and then it's matching the colors of the linoleum with the different yarns, so kind of picking up these undertones and looking at the process of where the material came from. Uh, so in the end, the carpet's really made to re-experience the world as a child. Um, of course, it's about revaluing this material, but a lot of the materials were from a time of my childhood or a time of other people's childhoods. I think they span a few different generations. Um, so I think the final result was really this expression of childhood, this expression of childhood experience. Um, and it kind of give, gave people an escape back into this childhood period through tactility. Uh, so yeah, you can see the whole piece here, uh, kind of the different materials, the origin story that I talked about, uh, but then they're built up together back in this way of childhood associations. So I think uh, as a child, we kind of remember things uh, in more of a fantastical way. Um, and I think this is something that people really connected to when they see the piece in person. So for example, you can see these mountains over here, I guess you could call them. Uh, they're all old vinyl from old couches and old pieces of furniture, but then they're sewed into these shapes that kind of remind you of building a fort, for example, as a child. Um, there's like these tiles over here. Uh, of course, you saw in the image previously, a lot of them were cracked, chipped on the side, but then this is kind of seen as an advantage. So they're all smoothed down on the edges to create these beautiful, soft little river stones um, that are then casted with rubber in between. So when you step on it, it kind of reminds you of going in the bathroom as a child, maybe. Uh, so yeah, if you can see the piece in person, it's something that people really were able to climb on and experienced in their own way. Uh, I think, yeah, having this experiential element really kind of added value for people to immediately make this connection, uh, both visually and through the tactile aspects of the textile mixed with the different materials. Um, so uh, here we have, yeah, this is more of a close up, the tiles, like I was saying. Um, and then I think this is a really good example of the in between areas between the different materials. Uh, so it's really meant as a visualization of how memories are recalled. So we don't always mem uh, remember things objectively, of course. I think memories are very subjective depending on the context. And um, yeah, of course. When you're a child nothing is really remembered properly uh, so it's kind of meant to visualize this you have kind of things merging into each other melting into each other if you will uh, hence the name of the work um, yeah another good example over here these kind of like yeah i guess morphing little mutations of the material the tiles turning into tufting turning into linoleum uh, so it's kind of creating this feeling when you look at the piece yeah, another example over here. Um, so yeah, in the end, it's really just a means for people to connect back to the material, take a look back at it, uh, and seeing it as more of the sum of its parts through connecting with each other and our childhood. This is a nice little text that I like to read when I speak about the work. Uh, reality and fiction become blurred, boulders become mansions, tiles become river stones, and the world becomes alive once again. I think it really sums up what the piece is trying to do. So on to the next project, um, which is an ongoing uh, uh, collaboration that I'm doing actually at the moment. I'm at a residency focusing on this uh, project that's ongoing. Um, and I think this takes a little bit of a different approach compared to the first two works that I described uh, that were really looking at this end of life cycle, discarded materials. Um, this also looks at the end of life, but also creating something new to last for a more sustainable future in a better way. So these are all um, biodegradable and bio-based silkscreen inks. Um, so this is a collaboration I've been doing for the past year with my partner, Annabelle Poe, and we've been developing our own silkscreen binder and uh, combining this with different pigments. So we've been working with different pigment suppliers 
A lot of them are local, so from different vegetables grown around the Netherlands and Germany that create these natural vegetable pigments, um, as well as another supplier we have in India that works with agricultural waste, um, which had some really interesting sources actually, like for example, like marigold yellow from uh, the temples, like kind of collecting these flowers and then creating this pigment out of it, which we're super honored to be able to use. Uh, this is just an indigo pigment that they're providing us with. Um, and the reason we're really doing this project is because there isn't really an alternative for silkscreen printing. Like natural dyeing is something that's becoming a lot more common and a lot more valued. Uh, but print is something that kind of lacks some options. So that's why we're working with a chemist to create this binder. So you can kind of see it's like the two pieces working together. Um, and it's not something that could work actually in the industry. It's not something that's meant just as like a DIY craft or something you can do at home, but we really want to use it up to an industry standard. Uh, so of course we're working with their chemists, testing washability um, and color fastness, which has been improving more and more. Um, and we're really excited about it uh, just because for normal textiles, if they're screen printed with an acrylic binder, which is kind of like the industry standard, it takes about 80 years just for the ink to dissolve. Um, because even if you're printing on a natural fiber, uh, if you work with this acrylic or plastisol based binder, it's essentially printing a small layer of plastic on the textile. So then, yeah, there's no point of really using a natural textile. It creates more and more micro microplastics in the wash, of course. Um, but we're really excited about using this as an alternative. Uh, we found that the ingredients should take uh, one to four years to degrade maximum, and they're all bio-based, so they're not um, harmful for the environment and, of course, the people working with them, which is also an issue regarding the pigments. Like a lot of unnatural pigments are, of course, very toxic and come from very unsafe sources, I guess. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's, it's a very exciting uh, process. And uh, this is a couple days ago, actually. So we're starting to print these large textiles, starting to put the ink to work um, and seeing how it can really be used. So they're, they're kind of done as a proof of concept to showcase the ink and the chemical research we've been doing for the past year. Um, so uh, this is another textile that we did. Um, and another really important aspect about the project is kind of changing people's attitudes towards print and towards color and kind of these expectations that we have for our printed textiles and garments over time. Um, so we decided to work with a combination of more color fast and traditional pigments like indigo, of course, which is the blue that you see here, um, as well as these like agricultural based pigments. Um, so this is like a yellow that we mix to create the green. Um, and over time, of course, it will fade, but it will fade in a way that it will still kind of show the indigo and kind of create this like warm color to cool color change. Um, so it's kind of meant as something that like maybe the colors are not always quite as vibrant, but maybe this is something that we can learn to kind of uh, see the beauty in in the future and not expect these incredibly vibrant unnatural colors um, as a more sustainable alternative. Uh, so these are a couple more of the textiles. So still to be finished, but the process is going. And the last work I'll be sharing today is called Soft Silica. It's an ongoing research that I originally started two years ago, but I'm still working on um, to this day. It's always evolving. Um, so all of this here is actually glass. It's a glass research that uses the hidden qualities of fiberglass. So everything is kind of made with this hybrid of textile techniques and glasswork techniques. Um, so I started the project just thinking about fiberglass as such a ubiquitous material. It's something that's really all around us. I mean, it's used for really everything, but usually casted with some sort of plastic resin. So um, yeah, made in this very unsustainable way. Um, of course, it's used a lot in fiber optic cables for the internet, for connectivity. So I think it's a very modern and relevant material to experiment with. Uh, we can take a look through some of the samples. Uh, so this is from the sample archive from the original research of the material. Uh, so I take fiberglass and work with it um, on an inning machine to create these shapes. Uh, and then it goes in the kiln as a secondary process 
uh, also a secondary transformation because glass is always this kind of push and pull and dialogue with the material. So here we have a knitted sample. You can really clearly see the textile, but if you were to touch it, it really has the qualities of glass and it's a very smooth and yeah, it's a very surprising texture, I guess, because it's really somewhere in between. You can see the texture over here, uh, really kind of this combination of these glass beads and these more textile-like structures. Uh, here, I think it's a really nice close-up image, just kind of looking at the, the quality of the material. Uh, yeah, like I said, it's really a dialogue with the material, this kind of push and pull and wanting to have control, but also relinquish control when you put it in the kiln. It also kind of has a mind of its own and it decides what it wants to do. Um, so you can see this is something that was melted. It used to be very tall and then it became like a whole other kind of object. But uh, if you can work with this, I think it's a very beautiful material process and something I find very fascinating. So this is kind of a good example of the material being controlled and the material being uncontrolled. Um, so finally, uh, I work with glass tapestries. So that's kind of the result of all the research I've been doing. Uh, so yeah, I see it as a new kind of textile, a new kind of craft that's kind of halfway between textile and glass, of course. Um, and I think looking very speculatively at the project, uh, it's a very interesting way of looking at the future of glasswork because, of course, there's a big sand shortage that is already becoming a big issue for glass production in the past few years. Um, so I'm not using reclaimed fiberglass yet in the process, but I think it's a very interesting thing to think about uh, as this being kind of the source of glass and the source of material uh, from all the discarded fiber optic cables. And then, of course, at the end of this material's life, it can break and turn back into sand, which I think is quite a beautiful thing. It's kind of taking the origin of the fiberglass and bringing it back to its roots. Um, finally, where the project is going today, uh, I'm focusing more on the tapestry aspect. So these pieces are very new. They're for an upcoming exhibition. Um, and I'm working on pre-existing kind of like medieval and Renaissance embroidery patterns. So these are all taken from reference images. And this is kind of adding another layer a contextual layer to the material, really. So it's creating these new kinds of embroidery pieces. Um, and the, they're going to be hung along these tapestries of the original textile, uh, but then with this new technique. So I'm very excited to see how they end up. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, that's the end of my presentation.